Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back to another Real Conversation where it's my pleasure and privilege to have a discussion with Lasse Peterson, who is a principal at AQR Capital Management. If you didn't know what that is, that's the big quant fund right down the road in Greenwich, Connecticut. He's also the author of an awesome book, which is called Efficiently Inefficient. He's a professor at the University of Copenhagen, professor at, at NYU. He should have, really is this book should be on everyone's desks and everybody's curriculum, and I'm looking forward to hearing our conversation. Thanks, Lasse, for taking the time. We really appreciate it, and uh, welcome to Hedgeye. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great. You're in the neighborhood because you are principal at, at AQR, which is something that uh, we introduced. But I also want to make sure that everybody you know, saw your book. I'm going to be using the book. This is a very important textbook now, actually, uh, since you're a professor at NYU. They use it, but they use it at many different universities. But I think it's a really good primer for anybody who kind of like walks around trying to understand what all these people do. Uh, you've had some great conversations with a lot of really important money managers out there, but I wanted to start with where you started the book, which is a really, um, not many people have uh, the humility, I would say, to start a book with this type of a sentence, but this is what I really loved about your book in general. It was, had a lot of humility, it, it had the combination of academic and, and really practitioner, which not very many people had. And then finally, it had depth and breadth by you really talking to other people who had a lot of, obviously, practitioner time as well. But this sentence was great. Uh, my first, and this is the preface to, um, to Lassie's book, my first experience as a hedge fund manager was seeing hundreds of millions of dollars being lost. <laughs> and that was in July of 2007. So I, I realize it's July of 2016, and, and I do feel parts of this uh, moment coming back to me. But what, what was it in July of 2007 that, that, that you were talking about? Yeah, so this was an amazing time. I, was, uh, I had been a professor at NYU and I started consulting with uh, AQR, which is a global asset management firm. Yep. And uh, then I decided to take a leave of absence and work full time at AQR, developing trading strategies and macro and, and stock selection strategies across global markets. And then uh, suddenly the subprime crisis started mm -hmm. and um, that the subprime crisis per se didn't affect us really much but all of a sudden there was a big liquidity event in, in global stocks where the cheap stocks started getting a lot cheaper and the expensive stocks got more expensive partly because other investors with similar position had to close their positions. This was especially starting in July 2007 and then especially mm -hmm. in the first week of August to, uh, 2007. And it really led to some uh, pretty abnormal price moves. Well, in particular, if you're sitting there, like from an academic's perspective, that thought that cheap stocks should bottom and go up and expensive should eventually top and go down, I mean, Cliff Asnes is really, you know, he really you know, debunked the efficient market hypothesis by saying that's not so, so much true. You know, there's this thing called momentum. And momentum versus value, that's a, a, something you focus on in this book. Uh, is that something that you finally could see with your eyes wide open? Yeah, so uh, if you look at value and momentum, these are two uh, strategies that are kind of opposite. They tend to both make money on average, but they actually tend to make money at different times. Right. But in, in August 2007, they actually started losing money at the same time, which is kind of unusual. And actually part of my own academic research also had been studying these liquidity crises, where you all of a sudden see this big drop where prices go down and down and down finally before they bottom out and go back up. Mm -hmm. And so the big question is when you start losing money and you're pretty sure, it's not because you have the wrong bet, it's because others are just selling indiscriminately. Yeah. You, what do you do? Do you then pile in yeah. to the trade because it's an even better trade? Or do you start selling too because you, know, you might be worried that you would be forced to sell later? Or how do you manage that risk? And how do you really try to get the most out of the situation? It becomes a very real, not academic question. Right, because a lot of people are, are piling in. It's natural for them to pile in at that time. So there's a, there's a reflexive or almost a behavioral aspect to this. When you're, I think you called it a liquidity spiral in yeah, your book. Is exactly, that, exactly. Yeah, so a lot of people uh, get afraid and start selling. And, and the, the more they sell, the more, the more the price goes down, the more other people might get, hit their margin requirement yep. and get forced to sell. And then the price goes down margin requirements might even increase and, and, and the people who are providing the funding get scared and, and force others to sell and yeah and I mean the, the whole net we've spent a lot of time with these real conversations bringing in you know the behavioral side of, of these debates which is really you know loss aversion or risk aversion there's a hu very human element to these crashes that we've had most recently and as much as there probably is to the crash to the upside 
in certain asset prices. But I want to take, before we go back to, I want to talk about momentum versus value and the managers that you've sat down with and how they, how they think about those kinds of style factors. But um, you have a great uh, table in the introduction of your book that, that kind of breaks down the principles of neoclassical finance, uh, efficient versus inefficient. And I was hoping that you could kind of try to, for the layman out there, like try to, t try to break it down versus what uh, maybe a, a linear economist or somebody might have thought before. Yeah, so the title of the book is a little bit cryptic, this efficiently inefficient. <laughs> and uh, the idea is that- I love it. <laughs> <laughs> there's always been this debate in, in, in financial economics, is the market efficient, meaning that prices reflect all the relevant information. And it means also that, you know, active management doesn't pay if, if the price is always right. You can't beat the market, so you should just be passive. Right. Or on the other hand, is the market inefficient? If the market is inefficient, prices are sometimes off, and you can actually profit by being active and smart about how you trade. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so there's a room for active management. And um, my view is that, and, and that's been a, the debate has very much been, the academics have been insisting the market is completely efficient, and a lot of practitioners who are actually running active management, they're obviously <laughs> of a very different view. And, and I basically think that you know, the truth has to be somewhere in between. It can't be that the market is completely efficient because somebody has to make the market efficient. Somebody has, if there's news comes out, somebody has to actually trade on that news to, for the news to be reflected on the price. And, and it takes a lot of time and effort to keep following all the news, processing all the information. And the compensation for that cost has to come in the form of outperformance. Right. So there has to be some kind of a scope for outperformance because otherwise nobody would collect the information. If nobody collects the information, how does it get into the price? <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, it is a very competitive world. There's yeah. a lot of smart managers trying to be the first to buy low and sell high. So there is some kind of equilibrium amount of efficiency. That there is, the market is just efficient enough that you, you don't make a killing doing this, but it's still inefficient enough that you can actually be compensated for all the cost. And, and then in the, the table I think you're referring to, it talks about all the broader implications of, of this insight yep. to, to economics and finance. Well, there are many. I mean, it's, uh, you really kind of debunk a lot of issues or at least give a, a pretty good, I mean, it's really a textbook for a reason. I mean, it's a, re, it's a great book for people to read that want to start and start to understand. That's why our interns read it, our first year analysts read it. It's a, it's a great book. Um, but on passive versus active, I mean, this is an interesting time because very few active managers uh, can outperform beta at this juncture. And it's something that has obviously found its way into passive fund flows. Uh, passive is beating active in many regards, beating a lot of managers, uh, hedge fund managers in particular. Why do you think that is, and or do you think that it's just a cyclical thing that eventually becomes efficient as well and goes away and active you know, has its place in the world? Well, I think you have to be uh looking over the long run to really evaluate yeah. whether you know active beats passive and i think if you look at the the data um, for u.s mutual funds over the long run the whole universe of u.s mutual funds have probably slightly underperformed passive after fees mm -hmm. uh, perhaps that's a like, key point after yeah. fees yeah but before <laughs> fees perhaps you know done a little bit better but mm -hmm. but the key point is just after fees and, and the academics used to interpret that average as saying, look, all active managers suck because the average <laughs> is just below. But, you know, I think that they're jumping a little bit to the conclusion that if you look at, you can't just look at the average. And, and there's a lot of research now that shows that the best managers, even accounting for the effect of luck, the best managers are more than worth their fees. Mm -hmm. So there are some subset that are more than worth right. their fees. There's a subset that are not worth their fees. And the average is sort of close to breaking even, mm -hmm. perhaps slightly. If you look at institutional investors, uh, the whole group of institutional investors seems like they have actually out in their active investment, they have outperformed even after fees. Mm -hmm. And I think if you think about the logic uh, of my book, that makes sense because you know investors have to be compensated for the cost of finding good securities, but uh, or managers, but investors. Have, uh, are then looking for the good managers who can actually do this. Right. And who, do, who, who uh, can find the good managers? That tends to be the larger, smarter, or institutional investors. Mm -hmm. So an institutional investor who has a manager selection team who finds a good manager who can then find the good securities, then you can see some outperformance by the manager and, and enough of that outperformance so that it's even being passed on after fees. Yep. But a small retail investor who picks a random manager 
uh, he may not that's, he may actually be better served with passive yeah that's pretty tough yeah so I think what you're seeing might be a move in, in the right direction is that the small retail investor is going more and more into passive which is I think what they sh probably should be doing given that the average active manager hasn't done so well but but you could still have a room for the large institutional managers uh, or, or investors finding the, the, yep. the good managers who can still deliver enough performance even after fees. Yeah, you, so you should, you should effectively also see a super premium fee in as much as average to below average managers should reduce their fees to try to you know, protect whatever it is that they think that they have. But if you can, can, can outperform, be in the top 30, 20% right now, you should get a premium fee to, upon what used to be considered a premium fee, should you not? I mean, yeah, if you, certainly if you uh, can confidently show that that outperformance is going to continue going forward. Yeah. I it's mean, all about going forward yeah. performance, yeah. I mean, it's hard to do, obviously, but I mean, uh, AQR has, uh, I think, what, $150 billion under management? Yeah, just over that, yeah. I think it's for good reason. It's called taking market share. <laughs> uh, but people pay for performance. They have to, uh, if they've ever had to, now that now is, is one point. Now, back to um, this value versus momentum and what people actually consider uh, valuable um, or something that could generate alpha. You, uh, you've interviewed in this book, you have George Soros, you have Lee Ainsley, you have, you know, just to rattle off the list, he's got like a, basically a who's who, Myron Scholes, Ken Griffin, John Paulson. Uh, I don't want to, like, obviously all these are really interesting meetings, but um, like how would you summarize, me, away from how you did in the book, what, how would you summarize just the experience or the ability to sit there with these guys and get them to actually tell you what they do, because not too many people can do that. Yeah. Unless you give them a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Because you weren't giving them money. Right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, it was a fantastic opportunity to really try to get under the hood and really figure out the secrets of, of what these guys are doing. I'm not necessarily sure they told me all their secrets, but, uh, <laughs> but it was really some very interesting conversation. And they're all very different. They're trading in different markets using different methods. Yep. But I think they have a number of things in common. Uh, I think they are all extremely smart, extremely driven. Uh, but uh, again, still uh, very different. But I think some of the things also in, in terms of their investment they have in common, uh, I think value investing is a theme that goes through uh, almost all of them. Really? And uh, momentum investing. The idea, so value investing, as you know, is the idea that basically try to buy securities that are cheap yep. relative to the fundamental value and short or sell securities that are expensive. Momentum uh, is a very different, is the idea that you're buying things that are trending up uh, and, and, and selling things that are trending down. And, and things that are trending up might have perhaps become expensive. So there's a tension between value and momentum yep. that tend to be, but they actually are not the exact opposite of one another because yep. Things can be cheap and trending up, so mm -hmm. then it has both value and momentum. Those securities tend to do especially well, yeah. especially in this environment. And for people, you know, that just want that explained on their screen right now, I mean, we've had some epic value stocks become huge momentum stocks. Utilities, consumer staples. I mean, they're not cheap anymore. They're expensive, and as you'd say, yeah. uh, getting more expensive. But that was not. That's not a. You know, that is intellectually kind of uninspiring for people back in the day to say, oh, yeah, you know, I buy an expensive stock after it went up 40%. No, so what you really want is actually to buy it. So if you're trading on value momentum, you're not buying, trying to catch the bottom. And catching yeah, the bottom is always, but you're really hoping to buy, uh, buy it when it's trending up but still cheap. Yeah. Because then it, you, you have some conviction that it's going to continue trending up until it reaches right. the fair value or perhaps beyond. But, but optimally, it, yeah, so it has to go down enough that there's room that it starts. So it's basically when the market is starting to recognize, oh, wait, uh, this is maybe too cheap, so it's starting to right. come up, then... Uh, the, the basic sign curve that we always show, when something goes from bad to less bad, and the price starts to reflect it, volume, volume, et cetera, reflected, that's good. That's when you actually get a real move and right. you can stay with something. But what about the people that are, you know, these classic kind of, they're not big time money managers, they're all over Twitter and everything else big all-stars in the, in the retail community, you know, they really buy high after the big moves. You know, it's, they buy high trying to buy higher. Um, you've got CMTs that do that. Some of them do that. Uh, historically, hasn't been a great strategy to, to stay with forever. But like, how about that component of it? Did you find in any of these guys that they were interested in that type of a strategy or pushing that far on the momentum curve? No, I, I don't think that was not the typical. So if you think of breakdown, so you have the Lee Ainsley, who uh, is one of the most famous so-called Tiger Cubs. He yep. 
his background was working uh, for Julian Robertson at Tiger. So Julian Robertson is, as you know, one of the really famous uh, hedge fund managers. And when he retired, you know, some of his uh, main uh, portfolio managers started their own hedge funds. And, right. and Julian uh, and Lee Ainsley is one of the, the most Fantastic. prominent of those. Yeah. yeah. And, and his strategy is very much to go out there to meet uh, the, the CEOs and the managers of the firms in which he's investing, uh, even the more local managers around the world to meet the customers, to meet the suppliers, to really get a sense of is this company well run, you know, what is it going to be profitable. And also he's very much looking across the whole industry yep. and, and thinking about this company in relationship to the other companies in that industry. Is this, gonna, this company winning that industry competition over mm -hmm. the next two, three years or is it losing? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and then really trying to buy companies with, with strong management, strong uh, profitability, and, and good valuation. So he's very much about the valuation. He's not so much about uh, the momentum, and to the extent he's, he's interested in the momentum at all, it's mostly, you know, he, he might not want to go against it right. too much, but, but he's certainly very much about the fundamental analysis. And he's very articulate, I think, as you can see from the interview. I think that goes well. There's a, the personality and the trading strategy often goes hand in hand. So, you know, when you go, have to go out there with all these meetings and extract the relevant information, <laughs> you know, being very personable and articulate yeah. can be important. And I think uh, he personalizes that extremely well. Yeah, they, they have, I mean, they, they used to have, I mean, it was a huge investment research team. And there are people I actually worked with at Magnetar Capital, the guy that we recruited to run healthcare research or the healthcare PM at Magnetar was uh, was a longstanding guy running healthcare for for Maverick. So I could see real time his process, his analysts, how diligent, like you said, very intelligent, obviously, but diligent and process driven that guy was. Yeah. Uh, his name was Howie First, actually. Um, but you know that that's the world I grew up in. I grew up like I came up in the hedge fund business in the years '99 through 2001. A guy named John Dawson from Dawson and Sandberg hired me. Art Sandberg, you know, started Pequot Capital uh, right. when they had their breakup, like most hedge fund people do. Um, but this, like, the, the environment has really changed versus when, what a hedge fund was then versus the kinds of clients that I talk to now, because I'm a strategist that talks to those kinds of clients, you know, the, the Mavericks and the, the Maverick Cubs, you know, there's like plenty of those. Yeah. But then there's a lot of really momentum-oriented investors. Like, I'm talking super huge momentum. And... Uh, it's much shorter term. Uh, there's nobody, maybe Cliff or maybe AQR is going to become one of the more famous ones, but there, is, is there anyone that you think is going to define the next frontier of what is alpha or earning their fees by generating like their returns off an explicitly momentum-oriented strategy? So the most momentum-oriented strategy is managed futures. And, and so... Uh, we, we do managed futures. That's also. big time. Yeah, right? at AQR. And, <laughs> yeah. and in the book, I talked to uh, David Harding right. of Winton Capital. Oh, epic. And, uh, yeah. and they're all about the trends. Yeah, and, uh, yeah I love that part of the book. Uh, so he's talking about, and he, he's, by the way, is very much against the efficient market hypothesis. He, yeah, yeah. He, he talks about uh, bashing that. But he, so he. Well, so is Cliff, right? Well, Cliff is sort of, he has a lot of respect. His PhD advisor was Gene Farmer, who won yeah. the Nobel Prize for saying the market is efficient. But he disproved the... He, <laughs> uh, yeah, he kind of uh, disproved it with momentum, if you will, but, uh, but he still has a lot of respect for Farmer, so yeah, he's yeah. sort of... Uh, he's nice to him. Yeah. And, and Cliff's not nice to everybody, so uh, on Twitter at least. Uh, but um, but go, go ahead, on Hard, Harding's epic. He's not a guy that a lot of Americans know, but uh, because he's not in the news every day, he's not on CNBC every day, but this guy has had an epic career. Yeah, and, uh, and it's very much about momentum. And, and, and so, uh, as I show in the book, you know, the whole managed futures uh, space has very much been driven by momentum. You can look at the returns on the main managers and, and basically break it down to sort of trading on trends over the last one, three, 12 months. So it's sort of that kind of trending over the last year. Mm -hmm. And I think where in individual equities, um, there's been what we talked about earlier, the sort of value of momentum in individual equities, that tends to be relative value and relative momentum. So is this stock outperforming another stock? Right. But when we're talking about managed futures, when we're talking about global equity futures, bond futures, commodity futures, currencies, 
there people tend to uh, trend on what's called time series momentum or just yep. sort of trends looking at every security in isolation is gold trending up or down right. if it's trending up go long if it's trending down go short mm -hmm. and there are different ways of measuring the trend but it's you know things like looking at the return over the last year or yeah. thinking at moving Generally, risk, yeah. that's why it's popular for people to talk about the i affectionately call them the moving monkeys but they are moving averages i mean yeah. it's it's price momentum and that's got to be the number one factor there can't be something else is there yeah in managed futures that's certainly the number one factor and it, it's been successful yeah. for for many years not every day or every month right. but over the long run it's, it's worked surprisingly well and it's actually even worked surprisingly well during crisis so in, in 2008 when a lot of other right. factors were struggling, managed futures did extremely well. Because you're on the short side, I mean, you're, the short side works just as well. So for example, in Brexit, I think you mentioned that there's managed futures had a great run during Brexit, did they yeah, not? Yeah, so during Brexit, uh, managed futures actually was uh, was doing well. Uh, hedge funds in general were not actually doing poorly uh, this time around. Sometimes hedge funds have struggled during crisis, but yep. during Brexit generally there wasn't you know, a huge moves in, in a lot of sectors, and managed futures actually did very well. And it it's was sort of interesting because if you think are they, if they're trading on trends, did they really predict Brexit? Not really. But was it that complete luck? I wouldn't say not complete. So really what happened was Brexit went from being almost uh, unthinkable to being more and more likely over time. <laughs> so there was a trend. Yeah. And, and, so, um, and you saw that in the prices. as as the British pound started trending yep. down. The signal was confirming. And, and, yep. and so the managed futures strategy will just tend to go short the British pound when it's trending down, irrespective of any opinion of the Brexit. Yep. And when then Brexit happens, that's the continuation of a trend yep. and you're profiting. Mm -hmm. And that's been true, by the way, if you look in 2008, or if you look in other crises, the way crisis tends to happen is prices go from normal to bad to worse. Right. And that's the trend. So when you go from normal to bad, you start shorting equities. You may go long bonds. Mm -hmm. You start shorting certain commodities and so on. And when it goes from bad to worse, mm -hmm. then you profit from those shorts. Yeah, I quite like that. I mean, in physics, we call that a phase transition. You know, it's easy to be paddling along in a nice base of water, but by the time you approach you know, faster water and a waterfall's on the other side of it, your point of entropy, it's over at that point. So there's a lot of people that you know, don't like to invest that way they actually get caught buying on the way down into the waterfall and then they get wiped out. But, um, you know, David Harding, I mean, he, he is not, I mean, it's almost like when I was reading, I mean, some of these quotes, this guy, first of all, you know, he started, he said he started in, the, in 1982 as a broker. Yeah. And he started by drawing charts by hand. Yeah. And literally writing down the prices every day. This is like, I'm not David Harding by no stretch, but I, that's exactly what I used to do because we never had technology. I mean, even if I could be a moving monkey guy, I didn't have the technology. I had to literally slide rule it and write it down, like write down prices. And he says that he actually learned to internalize the right. security or the price by writing it down every single day. How much of that did you see when you sat down with people? Were there a lot of David Hardings? No, I think they're all different and, and unique. In there. I mean, he, that was his approach and, and his unique way uh, entry into the whole business. I think uh, very different. Lee yeah. Ainsley's got a, a, a an army of research analysts. Yeah, he's writing down prices and following trends. Yeah, and, and Cliff Asmus, his background was doing a PhD and, and knowing all the academic research, con being an early contributor. His dissertation with the momentum. Yeah, I love that. Uh, yeah. And so he basically took his dissertation and other academic research and and went to Goldman and traded on it uh, very successfully, and then broadened that research and and now has an army of PhDs. <laughs> so, that, so, so that's sort of a very scientific approach. Yeah. And then uh, you have Soros that who have the, this sort of philosopher mind. He's, uh, you know, has this uh, office uh, on, uh, on top of a high rise overlooking Manhattan and has this very big picture view and, and sort of consistent with that yeah. being a philosopher, big picture. He trades in these macro markets, takes these big bets on the macro economy. And, and I think they're all yeah, have different starting points. Yeah, and there are less and less of the Soros's these days because you'd have to run the place to stay with those bets. You'd also have unlimited liquidity yeah. so that you could stay with the wrong bets. You know, it's, it's interesting that there are very few, we, we don't talk to a lot of up and coming George Soros's. We talk to a lot of people that are seemingly nervous about the macro environment on the wrong side of what you'd call a, 
uh, managed futures trend, uh, saying some. Well, look, it's not. It's not cheap. I can't buy it. Ah, it's too expensive. It's, it's it's still too expensive. Uh, but it, I don't want to short it because the chart looks good. I mean, we hear everything, yeah. but I rarely kind of see that old school um, George Soros. Is yeah, that so why he, he's coming back? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that could well be. And he he actually did tell me that uh, he that he thought that people did learn from him, and and he gave one example. John Paulson. Right. He's another guy you sat down with. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's another guy I sat down with. But actually, independently of that, Soros said that, said Paulson had gotten the conviction and, and the idea to put such a large bet on when he did the subprime trade from reading Soros's book. <laughs> really? And, and so the fact, so that I was thinking, this is great. Soros yeah. is saying that. So I went to Paul, when I was talking to Paulson, <laughs> I said, so Soros said it was really you got an inspiration for when the bet is so, uh, the idea was basically if you have a very asymmetric bet where your downside is very limited, your upside is very large, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of conviction in, in that upside, yep. then you should take really an enormous bet. Right. It's very rare to find such a, mm -hmm. such a, a skewed bet. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and Paulson said yes. Yep. In fact, indeed, he, you know, when he started putting on the trade and, and thinking about sizing it, he, uh, you know, Soros' book came to mind, and that's when he started to go for the jocular, as Soros famously Yeah, said. I mean, he's, he's, that's his style. I mean, that's why Stan Druckenmiller is one of the best of all time, because, you know, whether he taught Soros or Soros taught him, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, the whole concept, like uh, Druckenmiller would say, it's when you spread your wings, that's when you make the most money. When you have it right, you press. And that's what they're, that's a style that's also hard for people to do. They're constantly trying to book gains or nervous that the, the story is over or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it, it'd be nice to see more people, you know, pressing bets and, and, and saying, look, I have a unique view. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's just, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just more of a qualitative. I think it is important though at the same time. I think a lot of the managers will emphasize the importance of risk management and diversification. Right. So obviously, uh, right. you know, that can uh, pull you in a different direction. But it totally I, does. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's very important that uh, you stay alive and yeah. you diversify your bets and, and you really have a proper risk management yeah. at the same time. In doing so, like a lot of these called multi-manager hedge fund portfolios, they've really forced um, net positioning, to your point, on managers. So you can come on my platform, you can run money for me, and if you lose money, you're out, uh, which is fair. You know, you're in my house, you know, you live by my rules, and you got to run by these you know, parameters. Uh, but they're really tight. Like, they're really tight relative to, maybe we were just dumb in 1999 and 2001, but we didn't even care about net. Like, we would just, oh, let's swing it. Let's cover our shorts and let's get long. And that was, like, literally the hedge fund environment that I grew up in. I'm pretty sure it was for Lee Ainsley, too. There wasn't, we would never target net exposures, for example. Now, that's all I hear about. You know, I have to live in my box. I have to make sure... Like, if I'm a financials PM, I hate the financials, but I'm, you know, I'm 10% net long because that's what I have to be. It's not really a view. You can't really show your view if that's what you're doing in your box. So I wonder how much we've institutionalized too much of that. You know, I'm not saying that risk management's a bad thing. This is called hedge-eye risk management for a yeah, reason. Yeah. But, but I am trying to find the reason why so many people right now in 2016 can't beat beta. I mean, I, I think uh, people can still beat beta. I yeah. think there's a dispersion. It, it's certainly, it's a difficult environment, but I, I don't think it's, I mean, the risk management can put some constraint, but I think it's really important. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of the big blow-ups have really yep. happened when people didn't have when they did proper have risk management. Yeah. So I think uh, I would certainly uh, really stress the importance of, of really understanding the risk management and having position limits. I think uh, Chainos is another guy I talked to in the book you know, it's a very famous short seller, short at yeah. Enron. He, he talks about his uh, position limits also. And then when you're a short seller, uh, you have the, the problem that, you know, you're betting on the stock price going down. So yep. when the stock price starts going down, you lose, you make money. But when the stock price goes up, you lose money. And there's yep. no limit to how high the stock price can go. So you can lose an infinite amount of money in right. principle. Now, now Chena says, sort of half jokingly, He's seen more stocks go to zero than go to infinity, <laughs> so he's okay with that. He's got a lot of good one-liners too. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but that being said, he he does recognize that you know also it's not just that there's no limit to how high the stock price goes, but but as the stock price rises, his exposure goes up, his risk goes right. up, 
And so he will uh, tend to then shade down his position if it goes beyond his position limit. Mm -hmm. So no one position will wipe him out. Yeah, I, I, I'd 100% agree with that. Every place I've worked at, which has been you know, enough to know, anyone who violates their security specific exposures because they think they uniquely know that security better than everybody else, tends to over time find themselves in a blow up situation. Now, not all the time. It's also how you can become obviously a hero in your portfolio, but over time, the process of managing like single, yeah. particularly at the single security level. What I meant more so was like, you know, if you're just this year set up long utilities against short financials, there's 2,200 basis points in that position. That's a call, right? You don't have to hedge that. You can have yeah. that on. Yeah. And um, it's just for whatever reason that there's a good example of, I can't short the financials because they're cheap. I can't buy the utilities because they're expensive. And they've been saying it for a year. I mean, they're, they're a lot more expensive utilities are than they were a year ago. Yeah, no, you should be able to make those industry bets too. Uh, yeah. Certainly, yeah. It's, it's fun to watch, you know, because you have a lot of people like you do here, you do a great job really explaining that there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. And I think that if people want to be like in this herd of cats or they want to try to compete in the game, they have to know who's competing with them in it, uh, that there are a lot of different ways to do this job. Um, and uh, I, I, I just wanted to, like, again, make sure that everybody uh, understands that, that this is out there, that they can, they can read your book and learn from it. But I also want to thank you for that, for that too. No, oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Thank He's Lasse Peterson. I'm Keith McCullough. You can find me on Twitter. You, can't, you can only find him at AQR, but I think they have a guard at the door.